first reading for, t- for today is from Acts chapter 1. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers, the company of persons was in all about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas. Who became, a, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man bought a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called, in their own language, Echaldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it. And let another take his office. So one of the men who had accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go his own place. And they, ca- and they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our epistle reading today is from 1 Peter chapters 4 and 5. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, evildoer, or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteousness is scarcely saved, What will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls among prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. We rise for the Alleluia in verse.
The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 17th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Dear friends in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on this Confirmation Sunday. Amen. Amen. The text for this sermon is from our gospel reading about Jesus' high priestly prayer for each and every one of us and for his disciples to know him. The text will answer the question, what does it mean to know Jesus? There's a difference between knowing someone and knowing about someone. I was driving home from seeing my parents last Friday when my roommate from college called me. And after I picked up, we talked about a range of topics from baseball to Florida to his wedding in a few months and our time together in college. And then he asked me a question that kind of embarrassed me and caught me by surprise. He said, hey, do you remember that burger place that we always went down to on White Plains Road? What was it called? Oh, that's right, Mickey Spillaney's. And you would always get the sunrise burger with fries. Well done. What's wrong with you? <laughs> it was a bit embarrassing, but it was also endearing because he remembered this piece of information about me after all those years we've graduated. You know somebody by having shared lived experiences with them, like sitting in the back of classes together, suffering through a brutal Calm 100 final at 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning. And then you celebrate by going to the mall and then having that sunrise burger at Mickey's. By spending time around people, you develop personal relationships with them. You learn about things that make them unique. You know someone when you have shared, lived experiences with them. You can know someone, and then you can know about someone. An example of this would be like your favorite Red Sox player. You know where they're from, what school they went to, where they played minor league ball, their batting average of 238 from years ago. You know someone, you know about someone when you only have information about them, when you know them from a distance, but you have no shared lived experiences with them. This is important because in our gospel reading, Jesus is praying this high priestly prayer for his disciples, including you. Jesus says, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. Jesus prayed this high priestly prayer for you so that you would know him and have eternal life through him. Jesus knew his father. He had a very close relationship with him. And you know this because he spent a lot of time praying to his father and he would go off to quiet places to be with him. 
Jesus also had a very close relationship with his disciples. He spoke to them on a regular basis too, talked to them throughout all the regions of Judea, Samaria, and Galilee, and he taught them about the kingdom of God. Jesus also came to be in close relation with his people. He knew the needs of those who he, whom he came across. He knew where to find the blind man, the paralyzed man. Jesus knew all about the women at the well. He knew about the centurion's daughter. Jesus knew when Lazarus would die, and he wept. And Jesus knew that he would be betrayed by one of his own disciples. Jesus knows, and he makes himself known to all of us through scripture. He came to bring us in close relationship with him, with his father. He came not to bring just information about him. The question comes back to us. Do we know Jesus or do we only know about him? Do we know him on a personal level or do we know about him from a distance? We can know about Jesus. That's the easy part. We can recall what Luther's catechism teaches us about him. We could list off all his parables and miracles during his earthly ministry. We can recall that Jesus went from the cradle to the cross, to the tomb and back for us. We can also know about Jesus from sitting at home behind a computer screen. We only know about Jesus when it has become a regular habit to isolate ourselves from the body of Christ, his body and blood promised at the altar. We only know about Christ when we only read scriptures on Sunday. Jesus came not to give you only information about him or for you to know about him. Jesus came into the world to bring you eternal life. Christ came into the world to bring eternal life through the forgiveness of sins. Jesus came to establish this deep flesh and blood relationship with you. In our Ascension Day service on Thursday, we talked about what it means for Jesus to sit at God's right hand. The right hand of God means that Jesus is here and now, present with us not just somewhere out there. At God's right hand, Jesus knows you. He knows your hurts, your wants, your needs. And it reminds us that even though when we can't always see Jesus, we know that he's got his eyes watching over you. At God's right hand, Jesus is no longer limited to being at one place at a time, but he's with you everywhere through the Holy Spirit. Jesus makes himself known and available to you. And that's why you are never alone when you're facing these hurts and challenges in your life. It's because Jesus knew what it was like to face them too. Hebrews tells us, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus shared every possible lived experience with you when he bore our flesh and sins upon his shoulder to be our savior. Jesus felt pain when the nails went through his hands and feet. He suffered on the cross. He thirsted and he wept. Jesus died a physical death for you. But he would also rise for you on the third day. And that's because you are precious to him. Jesus came to bring you into close relationship with your Father in heaven. This is why we have confirmation classes and programs at church. It's for you to know your Lord and Savior Jesus at a deep and personal level. These confirmation classes and programs aren't just about gathering as much information as you can about our Lord and from a distance. It's about developing that deep, personal, and ongoing relationship with him through shared, lived experiences with those around you. 
That's why we went to places like, with the, with the youth, that's why we went to the places like the trampoline park, the apple orchard, Colton Dixon concert, work camps to serve our neighbors. And on Tuesday youth nights, we made yummy, cheesy crusted quesadillas. These are all there, these shared lived experiences for you to know about our Lord and Savior, not just about him. There's a saying that it's all textbook until you put it into practice. It's all just information until you practice and live it. I guess it's to say that all of these classes and programs aren't just the end. It's the beginning of our lifelong learning and journey with Christ. So dear brothers in Christ, I'd like to ask you and have you think during this week, how can you know more about your Lord and not just about him? How can you help our confirmands who are graduating today know about our Lord and not just about him? What Bible studies or programs will help you with that? How can you get in involved knowing that the Lord knows you and loves you? This is a special day for our confirmands, but it's a special day for you too because it's a reminder that Christ knows you and he has come to reveal his Father to you. Amen.